Hello and welcome to another episode of Casual Learning. I'm your host, John Bannon. What's the deal with Bertrand Russell's teapot? Bertrand Russell uh, is a deceased atheist philosopher. And probably one of the most famous things he's known for is what's called Bertrand Russell's teapot. Uh, and this is what Bertrand Russell said. This is a quote from him. He said, If I were to suggest that between the Earth and Mars there is a China teapot revolving about the sun in an elliptical orbit, Nobody would be able to disprove my assertion, provided I were careful to add that the teapot is too small to be revealed, even by our most powerful telescopes. But if I were to go on to say that, since my assertion cannot be disproved, it is an intolerable presumption on the part of human reason to doubt it, I should rightly be thought to be talking nonsense. If, however, the existence of such a teapot were affirmed in ancient books, taught as the sacred truth every Sunday, and instilled into the minds of children at school, hesitation to believe in its existence would become a mark of eccentricity and entitle the doubter to the attentions of the psychiatrist in an enlightened age or of the inquisitor in an earlier time. So, <laughs> Bertrand Russell, being an atheist, uh, is saying that uh, you shouldn't um, question his disbelief in God, just like you shouldn't question someone's disbelief that there is a China teapot orbiting somewhere between Earth and Mars. So, in other words, if you would have the same, I mean, if you would have skepticism about someone's assertion that a teapot is orbiting somewhere between Earth and Mars, why aren't you allowed to have the same skepticism when it comes to God? Uh, you know, according to Bertrand Russell, they're both um, unfalsifiable claims. And therefore, they should be treated the same, both with disbelief. And Bertrand is uh, essentially shifting the burden of proof, uh, in his mind at least, onto the person making this unfalsifiable claim to prove that it's true. Uh, rather than saying the burden shifts to others to disprove this. Now, this is a very uh, common argument uh, made by atheists. And the, it basically goes on the lines of, well, it's your burden, theist, to prove God exists. It's not my burden to prove that he doesn't exist. And therefore... I'm justified uh, as an atheist uh, not believing in God. So that's how that goes. Um, you know, being a theist, uh, I see big problems with this argument. Uh, and in addition, I'm also an attorney. I've been a, I've been a licensed attorney for 25 years. And I know quite a bit about burdens of proof. So, uh, you know, let me give you the real deal about Bertrand, Bertrand Russell's teapot. Uh, so the first thing is, Bertrand Russell is creating some sort of burden of proof. Uh, but in what sort of proceeding is he talking about? Uh, you know, there are burdens of proof in 
the civil and criminal law uh, for purposes of uh, a trial for either a judge or jury to decide something. Uh, but that's, a, that's an official proceeding in which there's a burden of proof. So what official proceeding is Bertrand Russell even talking about? So generally speaking, we don't live our lives um, with a burden of proof constantly going off in our heads. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> what is he talking about? What, what burden of proof is he talking about? Um, you know, people, people make up their own minds on things based on their thinking about it, uh, whether it's logical or illogical, and their feelings about something. And they make their minds up about things, whether they want to believe something is true or not true. And almost nobody uses a, some sort of official burden of proof in their mind when they decide whether to believe something or not. People don't walk around thinking about a burden of proof. So when you're talking about, you know, something like, well, should you believe in God or not? God isn't on trial. There's no official burden of proof with regard to that question, whether God exists or not. People make up their own minds. They don't, they don't, they don't have to listen to Bertrand Russell's opinion on the matter. Um, so, uh, you know, just, just generally speaking, um, you can make up your own mind about whether God exists or not. There's no burden of proof. There's no official burden of proof. And even if there were, you don't have to use it anyway. I mean, nobody has control over what you believe or what you don't believe. I mean, in the United States, you have a First Amendment right to believe whatever you want. You don't have to base a belief on a burden of proof. <laughs> so, where's Bertrand Russell getting this? The burden of proof? Yeah, burden of proof according to Bertrand Russell. Well, who's he? He's just a philosopher. That's it. Is there some, you know, book of philosophical rules for proofs? No, there isn't. There's no such rule book. There's no, you're never going to find a philosophical rule book that says that the burden of proof is just like Bertrand Russell said it was. So even in philosophical circles, Bertrand Russell's burden of proof is not an official rule. It's just something, it's just an argument he made. That's all it is. You can ignore it. Um, you know, <laughs> we don't live our ordinary lives uh, only believing in that which has scientific proof uh, or evidence uh, and disbelieving everything else uh, that doesn't. Um, you know, if we lived like that, we would give a presumption of uh, disbelief for everything not scientifically proven. Uh, that's a very, very skeptical way of living, and it's paralyzing to live that way. Uh, nobody lives like that. And when it comes to the question of whether God exists or not, um, that's a personal belief, and uh, there's no official burden of proof uh, for that. Not at all. You make up your own mind about that. No one can stop you uh, from believing or disbelieving. And you, and you have a civil First Amendment right to believe whatever you want on that matter. Uh, and there's no burden of proof. God is not on trial. Uh, simply, simply put, he's not. God is not on trial. There's no burden of proof. You know, I mean, if you lived a life where everything that you believed had to be based on, you know, scientific evidence or testing, uh, you couldn't do something as simple as eat a bowl of soup without having it first tested for pathogens or poisons, right? <laughs> Nobody lives like that. Nobody. Nobody just says, well, I don't believe that this, you know, that this soup is safe to eat because it hasn't been scientifically tested by a laboratory and certified as, you know, free of pathogens or poison, so I can't eat it. 
<laughs> Nobody does that. Uh, so Bertrand Russell's teapot is, in real life, it's totally unrealistic. Nobody does this. Um, you know, again, burden, burdens of proof. Those are for trials, official proceedings, uh, where the law establishes such a thing. Uh, Bertrand Russell's teapot is not an official proceeding or a trial, and it's not even an official statement of philosophical rules and debate. It's just one atheist philosopher's opinion about what you should believe and what you shouldn't believe. Based on what? You don't have to pay any attention to Bertrand Russell's teapot when it comes to deciding whether God exists or not. Um, just ignore it. Um, so, there's also a fundamental problem with uh, Russell's teapot when it comes to the question of the, whether God exists or not. And that's this. That um, Russell's teapot is talking about a, a, a China teapot orbiting between Earth and Mars. And He's saying that, well, just because you say that we don't have telescopes powerful enough to tell us to, to prove whether it's there or not, that you have you have to believe that it's there because I said so. Um, so R Russell, Bertrand Russell is trying to compare a China teapot to God and try to make the same argument. But there's a big difference between a teapot and God. Um, a teapot is material. It's made of matter. It has mass. It's something that can be seen. It's visible. So, you know, theoretically, if you had a big enough telescope, I suppose, you could spot whether this teapot was actually orbiting between Earth and Mars. Um, now, God, on the other hand, is immaterial. God is not made of matter, or energy, or space-time, or gravity, or... Uh, particles. Um, God is not made of anything. God is actus purus. He's an uncaused being. Um, you can't see him. Uh, means he's invisible. Invisible. So, there's no telescope that could possibly see God. Because he's immaterial and that makes him invisible. So, even if you had, you know, the universe's largest telescope, you would never be able to spot God because he's immaterial and invisible. He's not capable of being verified in his existence by scientific means. Science only studies the material, the here and now, um, the cause. Um, Teapot is also caused. God is uncaused. So, uh, science could address the question of whether there's a, there's a teapot orbiting between Earth and Mars. It could, theoretically. If you had a big enough telescope, yeah, you could do it. But you can't do that with God. God is not subject to scientific experimentation because God is immaterial. Invisible and uncaused. God is not material. God is not 
um, uh, capable of being scientifically studied. You can't, you know, build a rocket and sh you know take off and go travel and find God, because God is outside the universe. Uh, God is in the realm of the metaphysical. Whereas the teapot is in the realm of the physical. So the physical is, can be studied uh, scientifically, but the metaphysical cannot be beyond the physical. This is beyond the universe. Um, you can't leave the universe uh, to study anything beyond the universe. Uh, you can't leave the universe or send scientific instruments beyond the universe. That's because of the law of conservation of energy. Um, you know, a scientist is made of matter. A scientific instrument is made of matter. Matter is a form of energy. Um, so if you were to leave the universe or a scientific uh, instrument were to leave the universe, that uh, mass and energy would have to disappear from reality. Boom! disappear because it's going to another universe, right? Well, that means some energy has been lost from the universe, from our universe. But that's a violation of conservation of energy. Uh, that's a fundamental law of physics. Um, that can't happen. That's impossible. So you can't leave the universe. Uh, science can't leave the universe. Science can't study or verify the truth of the existence of God because God is purely metaphysical. Beyond the universe, not material. So because of that reason, uh, Russell's teapot doesn't even apply to God because he's not physical. It's not even a valid argument against believing in God. Maybe against teapots, material teapots, but not against God. Metaphysical. Um, so... Russell's teapot does, only applies to material things. It doesn't apply to metaphysical beings like God. It's not even a, it's not even a proper uh, argument against God. You can completely ignore it. Uh, it's, it's a uh, red herring. It's a total red herring against uh, an argument for the existence of God. You know... God um, is a metaphysical concept used to prove or to solve a physical problem, which is, the physical problem is, you know, how, how is anything made real uh, in reality among the infinite possibilities for material reality? So, there has to be something that decides what what becomes real and what does not become real uh, in material reality. It's got to start somewhere. And I have plenty of videos which explain this, which you can you can watch. So, God is a metaphysical being, a concept that must be true in order for the decision to be made of what becomes real and what does not become real uh, in material reality out of the infinite number of logical possible material realities. Uh, so, because God is in the realm of the metaphysical, you can't use scientific method. You can't use a scientific method or scientific proof or scientific evidence or anything like that to um, prove God exists. Uh, because God is in the metaphysical, you have to use um, metaphysical argumentation, uh, which is uh, philosophy, which involves uh, logic and reasoning and deduction. Or, in some cases, induction. So, this is how you prove the existence of God, using logic, reasoning, deduction, maybe induction, and making logical arguments um, that make sense. That's how you prove God exists. Um, you know, besides, 
witnessing a miracle that proves it. Uh, but this is how you actually go about proving it. And this is done. This I've had plenty of videos that you can watch which prove God exists uh, uh, using metaphysics and logic, reasoning, and deduction. There's no burden shifting in this. There's just... It's just logic and reasoning. Does it logically make sense? Does the argument for God's existence make sense or not? Or is there a logical flaw in it? Is the, is the deduction incorrect or the induction incorrect? Is there some way you can uh, prove that one of the premises for the proof for the existence of God is false? So this is logic and reasoning. It's got nothing to do with the scientific method or scientists or... Um, Proving a teapot, you know, this is just a magical a matter of logic and reasoning. You know, if, if you can make a logical uh, proof and argument that God must exist, that's worthy of belief. Uh, you don't need to ask about burden shifting. <laughs> burden shifting is only when the evidence is unclear, or it could go both ways. So you use a burden shifting argument. Uh, but not in metaphysics. You don't need you don't need a burden of proof in metaphysics. You just need solid logical arguments. I mean, they're they're either there or they aren't. And if they're there, they're worthy of belief. Uh, and they are there. The arguments for the existence of God, the cosmological arguments for the existence of God, are there. They make sense. They are worthy of belief. Um, you don't need uh, to worry about burden shifting. I mean, you know, the arguments for God, I've done videos on, but they're there. Um, there's plenty of them. There's, you know, there's the first cause argument and the prime mover argument. Um, which, uh, then there's um, the uh, beginningless time, time paradox. And there's, well, there's also the Big Bang. Um, uh, there's the basically the first order argument. You know, there has to be a metaphysical being to establish the first order so that everything else material will base its existence on that initial order um, through the laws of physics and as it develops. So there's a first order argument. Um, there, then there's more metaphysical arguments for the existence of God. There's plenty of them. And plenty of them are logical and worthy of belief. Uh, so, Bertrand Russell's teapot doesn't even apply to metaphysical arguments. And even if it did, there's plenty of meta metaphysical arguments to prove the existence of God. Plenty to, to, you know, believe in God. Uh, and uh, those who don't are, don't know the arguments are, are foolish. So, um, so, you know, the bottom line is uh, Russell's teapot doesn't apply to the question of the existence of God. Uh, don't let it confuse you or, uh, you know, make you become a skeptical uh, unbeliever or non-believer uh, just because some atheist philosopher has his opinion about uh, what the burden of proof ought to be on the question of the existence of God. I mean, who's he? Who does he think he is? He's just some dead atheist philosopher. You don't have to pay any attention to him at all. None. And you shouldn't for the reasons I gave you. All right. Um, that's it on the teapot. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. Maybe I'll address them in a future video or in the comments below. And please press the subscribe button. I appreciate it. All right. Take care.